so thank you so much for coming on the last day before Thanksgiving. We will really have uh, exciting lectures for you, just to keep you up. Okay, so uh, what we are doing today is that we are starting a discussion about uh, dislocations. And if you remember last time we talked about uh, point defects, which were zero-dimensional defects in crystals. And today we are talking about dislocations. And what is really interesting about dislocations is that they're not necessarily thermodynamically stable defects in contrast to point defects, something that we mentioned uh, last time, but they are rather introduced either through growth or through, for example, mechanical behavior. And what we will learn today is that the dislocation or the concept of the, of the dislocation has been introduced a uh, long, long time ago, even before we were able to directly uh, detect them or even image them. And uh, the reason why they were introduced is to uh, somehow explain the discrepancy between mechanical behavior and the materials, the theoretical uh, mechanical behavior, and we will specifically talk about what kind of mechanical behavior we, uh, we are talking about, and uh, what is observed in practice. So we will see that, again, the dislocations have been postulated. They have been uh, used uh, for many, many years before people were actually able to detect them and visually observe them. So let me just again remind you is that we are in the, right now in the stage of describing defects in materials. And we mentioned that defects really govern many of the properties of the materials. So in the last couple of lectures, we specific, specifically talked about point defects, which can be either vacancies or interstitials or substitutionals. And we talked about how they behave in different types of materials, whether this is a metal or ionic crystal, etc. And what we really learn is that at a given finite temperature, there is a certain concentration of point defects that is thermodynamically stable. What that means is that there is a certain energy that is required to form this, but again, you're increasing the entropy. Um, so by, by introducing uh, point defects, you're increasing the entropy of the system, so balancing these two things together will give you the equilibrium concentration of point defects. Um, and again, these were zero-dimensional defects. What that means is that they are very localized. So if we talk about individual atoms, and therefore the strain or the, the formation of the crystal around them is relatively small. So they are relatively difficult to directly be observed. So in contrast, dislocations are so-called line defects. And one particular image of dislocations is shown, is shown here. So this is a transmission electron microscopy image of a metal. And the dark lines that you see here are the dislocations that propagate through this material. You can see that, again, the reason why we call them line defects is because they do appear as lines. So these are collective uh, defects that do not uh, depend only on a single atom. They depend on a number of atoms, and they propagate throughout the material along different uh, what we will call dislocation lines. What you can see, for example, in this example here, is that the density of the dislocations can be really, really high. And in practice, in metals, there are many, many dislocations. So we will like learn about how we quantify the, the amount of dislocations, how we describe the, uh, the magnitude of the deformation, etc. But again, just to give you a snapshot of a typical metal, you will see many, many dislocations in metals. We will see there are materials that have to be extremely pure, for example, semiconductors, silicon, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide. For them to function as semiconductors, they have to be dislocation free. So we will see that for some of the examples, dislocations are really beneficial. For some of them, they are really killing the application. So you really need to know how you introduce them, how you remove them from the material, etc. So I already alluded to the fact that you can remove them, for example, from the material. So what that means is that, again, they're not thermodynamically stable. So there are processes where you can anneal the metal and remove certain density of, or reduce the density of the dislocations. So these are all things that we will uh, uh, learn step by step. But before we do start talking about specifically dislocations in materials, I would like to mention that the word dislocation is also used in other areas of life. And it usually indicates that there is a, some disturbance of the periodicity or some disturbance of the regular structure of the material, right? So you know about the dislocations in our body. So what, what that means is that if you have a, a equilibrium position of one of your bones, if you move it from that equilibrium position, this is called dislocation. So, and as it turns out, I, during my PhD, I worked on understanding dislocations in gallium nitride, which is a semiconductor. And after four years looking at these dislocations, I saw dislocations everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I was driving around Switzerland and I saw this vineyard. And you can, for example, see an extra line here. 
and it really resembled me of these locations in crystals, we will see that they actually look very, very similar. But again, the reason why I'm showing you this is there is this periodicity, and there is this extra line here, and it is there because it has to accommodate for the slope of this hill. Right? If this was just a flat surface and regular vineyard, there is no reason to introduce this type of a defect or a dislocation in this particular case. However, in this, per in this particular case, there is a slope, there is a hill, and to accommodate for that, you have to introduce additional line here if you don't want to lose uh, the surface. And again, this, that all indicates to you that there is either some disturbance or there is some, um, in crystals we will see stress that introduces these defects, okay? And um, again, this would be another, another typical transmission electron microscopy image of dislocations in a metal. And again, the reason why we see dislocations, why you see these lines here, is because the strain around the dislocation is so significant that when you take this image using electrons, the electrons are scattered dramatically different here in the perfect region of the crystal and here around the defect itself. If you wanted to image, for example, a point defect, that would be impossible using this type of imaging because the strain around the point defect is so small. So again, I'm emphasizing the fact that dislocations do indeed introduce significant strain within the material and th this enables us to see them directly. Okay? Um, Another thing that I wanted to mention is that in many instances, uh, the presence of the dislocations is desirable in materials. So we will see that, for example, there are many strengthening mechanisms in metals specifically, and one of them is introducing more and more dislocations, right? So sometimes, again, for plastic deformation, the presence of the dislocations is the desirable. Uh, but, for example, conductivity in semiconductors, but also in other uh, materials, um, the dislocations are really killing the, 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 uh, the conductivity, electrical conductivity. So it is non-desirable. So what that means is that in semiconductors, for example, you really want to get rid of these dislocations. In metals, again, depending on the application, but if you're really thinking about high strength materials, you want to increase the, the density of dislocations. So again, understanding how they form and how they influence different properties is really important. I can ask you a question. Why do you think, for example, the, the conductivity, ele electron conductivity in semiconductors depends or it's reduced if there are dislocations in the material? Why would that be? Why are electrons somehow influenced by defects? Any guesses? Yes? Because they have to travel through like messy sections of the crystal for their thing, which is more difficult than like a smooth, regular Exactly. So what the answer was is that the electrons have to go through this, what you call the messy region of the sample. What that means is that electrons travel to a very periodic potential of the crystal, and that's relatively easy, right? You, and it depends on the details of the crystal and structure. But if suddenly you have some aperiodicity in the crystal, they're completely scattered. So if there is a dislocation here and strain around the dislocation, instead of get, going straight along the applied electrical field, they will be scattered in different directions, change their direction, and that slows them down. So again, for that reason, in semiconductors, the density of dislocations in the or is in typically in the order 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5th of dislocations per centimeter squared. In metals, this can be orders and orders of magnitude. We can see that it can be 5 to 6 orders of magnitude higher. So uh, I already um, alluded to the fact that the dislocations can be formed in, in different ways. So we will see that dislocations in metals are introduced by plastic deformation of the material. In semiconductors, for example, they are consequence of the growth. So this would be an example of gallium nitride material that is grown on sapphire. And I'm very proud of these images because I took them. <laughs> so what you will see here are different uh, lattice planes. So the, 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 the bright spots that you see here, are they correspond to different lattice planes in the crystal. So if you look at this particular image, there is nothing different, right? So you have sapphire, there is obviously an interface, and then gallium nitride continues on the top of this image. But when you zoom in, 
then you will observe that there is a discontinuous lattice. So for example, if I grow from gallium nitride into the sapphire, which is aluminum oxide, and if I look very closely, there is this lattice plane that continues throughout the material. But this particular plane stops. So what that means is that there is an extra plane inside of the gallium nitride material that does not propagate through sapphire or rather way around, right? So we start from sapphire, but it's a detail. So what that means is that the dislocation in this particular material was formed simply because there is a small difference in the lattice parameters between the sapphire and gallium nitride. So this is something that you cannot avoid. So if you want to grow, for example, gallium nitride or any semiconductor that is free of these dislocations, you have to find a lattice matched substrate. So what again, you want to find a, a crystal that is as close as possible in the lattice parameters uh, compared to the material that you want to grow. But again, this is just a property of the material growth. And again, dislocations can be introduced throughout the growth. But I alluded to the fact that again, the dislocations have been postulated simply by observing mechanical properties of, of metals. And this is a very text heavy slide, but what I wanted to say with this is that um, dislocations have been postulated in 1930s to explain the discrepancy between the theory of stress threshold that is related to permanent deformation and what is theoretically observed and what is experimentally measured. So what that means is that people would, for example, take a piece of a metal and they would deform it. And they will measure what is the stress or what is the force that is required to deform that material. And they would calculate, well, we know that the crystal structure looks like this, and this is the force or this is the stress that we would really assume, assume that the material uh, needs to experience to, have, to, to go through this plastic deformation. And they really notice that there is a significant discrepancy between these two properties, the calculated and the measured. So they introduce the concept of dislocations, and I will uh, lead you through this you know, analysis, and we will try to understand what, what that means. But first, we will have to understand a couple of basic, uh, we will define a couple of properties of the materials and how they in general behave.